Много благодаря, че сте дошли. Ам... Да, окей. Okay. Да, да. Добре. Казвам се Жулиета Мандажиева, адвокат съм и съм тук от името на Цифрова република, което е Сдружение на Сърчаващо защита на дигиталните права и а, достъпа на всички до нови технологии, данни и демократизма в интернет, най-общо казано. Тази тема в голяма степен засяга точно тези неща. Първо обаче искам да попитам, доколкото мога да се ориентирам, повечето хора тук говорят български. Ако има някой англоговорящ, ще мина на английски. Но... Oh. You have translation or... Um... You can't, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> because Bulgarian is not that easy. Okay, then I'll just speak in English as it was announced anyway, because it shouldn't be fair. So, um, well, thanks. First, um, I think this is a quite an important topic because this is actually the way bots and artificial intelligence will, will interpret the human world for the next few decades. So how we train these bots and what, um, whether they have access to as diverse data as possible is quite important. And legal implications of um, text and data mining generally would define in the next one decade whether we have diverse data which is as non-discriminative as possible or whether we will be confined to use data that is in the public domain, released under Creative Commons licenses, or licensed explicitly to the mining enterprise. First, can you guess who said that? Your copyright law is terrible for the internet. Anyone? No guesses? Okay. Boris Johnson. The EU's new copyright law is terrible for the internet. It's classic EU law to help the rich and powerful. Boris Johnson dislikes them. And we should not apply it. It is a good example of how we can take back control. Perhaps before he tweeted that, he hadn't really checked what the CDPA, the Copyright Designs and Patents Act of the UK, has been saying since 2014. And we will see whether the EU copy copyright law is that different from the UK law in this respect and whether a Brexit would really help the situation unless they change their CDPA, of course, which is a national law and it's not EU-driven. You might and my, or might not know, but law always needs to define their own concept of reality in order to be able to regulate it, address it, enable it. Because if you don't define it, then you can't really say that the law relates to it. So to us lawyers, text and data mining has any automated technique aimed at analyzing text and data in digital form in order to generate information, including but not limited to patterns, trends and correlations. This is the new definition of the copyright in the Digital Single Market Directive, which has come into force this year, in May, and will become part of the national legislations of the member states in two years. So, to us lawyers, this is text and data mining, and I'm going to be speaking about it in this presentation. However, it's part of a process, and how you get there is equally important. Generally, it's done from unstructured data, but on the other hand, you can, of course, form target data sets and train your bot on them. So you either want to analyze unstructured data to get an answer to a question that was not even answered in the first place, or you have a specific task, you want to train a bot, you want to create a targeted data set and train your bot on that, data set and then use it to ask questions that have been answered by a human, or at least a human has thought about them on other data sets. Both things are quite important and both things involve 
in one way or the other the text and data mining activity which is already in the realm of regulation of European law. In my work, I often find that software engineers, digital services providers, and people active in this field are really surprised when they start to realize that their work is regulated in some way or the other already, and that they can just freely do whatever they want and trust that it will be legal because it's good for society. So I would I really want to tell you how to do your work and keep it legal because you can sell it better in this way and you can't force any claims in the future. And it's a rather complicated topic with this particular activity. So for the purposes of this presentation, we will talk about text and data mining, meaning text, fixed images, tables and graphs and audio. Because it does make a difference if you have videos, if you have film, if you have songs or if you just have what we have listed here. If you're one, a member of GAFA, a big tech company, then perhaps the data you are mining will be all yours. You will have it under your roof, you will have put a framework around it that said that whatever consumers generate, you can mine and they, um, they transfer all the economic rights deriving from their copyright to you. But if you're not in that fortunate position, then you might be licensed to do your TDM activities on the data, which is, we see rarely these days, but maybe we will be seeing more in the future. Or you could have lawfully obtained it for some other purpose or scraped it, scraped it from the Internet. And we will see, this, in particular, scraping from the Internet, that it can pose a lot of a whole array of legal challenges and that actually is perhaps the most complicated issue that you will have to deal with other than designing your bot and using it. So before you start your mining activity, you obviously have to have access to the data. In order to have lawful mining activity, this access needs to be lawful as well. And this is a concept around which both US and EU law rotate, but it means different things in each of these huge jurisdictions. So you need first to collect it, then you can mine it, then you can narrow down on a slice and compose a data set, normalize the data, cleanse it, balance it, clean the, uh, remove the discrimination bias as much as you can, and train your bot on it. For each of these ac activities, you will need to have had a lawful access in the first place. Otherwise, these activities will not be lawful as well. So the scene is set for a legal nightmare. And why is that? First, you have a variety of sources and authors. This in itself makes the issue very complicated because each author has an exclusive right over what, they over what they have created, and usually they can say exclusively what are you entitled to do with it. So if you scrape data from the Internet, obviously you deal with millions and maybe billions of authors, and then you will have to be able to figure out what each of them meant about their work. Then the global reach of crawling and scraping means that there will be different laws that will apply to your work. It will not be only one law. It will not be the law from the jurisdiction where you're under, from the country, sorry, where you're undertaking your activity. It will be the law of many other countries as well that will be important in some way or the other. Copyright is exactly what it says it is. It's the right to copy, to copy the material in question. And uh, unless the author has expressly allowed you to do so, normally you can't copy it. There are some notable exceptions, and we will talk about them. But this is why we say it's an exclusive right. As soon as uh, some sort of material that attracts copyright emerges, then the author is solely entitled to say what third party, another party, can do with it, whether you can copy it, whether you can read it, whether you can um, change it and 
make something else with it, incorporating the first work as well. You will say if it's on the internet, then it's free, but it's unfortunately not the case. Then we'll talk a little bit about the related rights, and if there is time, I will touch upon the data protection aspect of data scraping, of web scraping, web crawling and scraping, which is also an interesting one, although not as complicated as the IP aspect. I told you what exclusive right means. It's something like the ring of Sauron. It's my precious once I have created it. Then it's almost 100% with some exceptions that I and only I can say whatever is to be done with it. Some authors, some theorists, some countries say that copyright is even as intensive and as important right as life and liberty. So they almost put it in the category of moral rights. It's very important to understand that copyright does not protect the ideas. Anyone can have the same idea. It protects the expression of the idea. So I might say that the sky is blue and this will not attract copyright, but if I say it in a poem, and this is the general idea behind it, but the poem is very beautiful, with a lot of interesting words used inside, with rhythm, then this poem will attract copyright. And then how third parties can use copyrighted uh, works lawfully is a million-dollar question, which is being answered differently in the US and the EU. Other jurisdictions like New Zealand, Australia would, and Canada would answer this question more or less like the US. And as to Asia, I don't... There, it depends whoever has had cultural influence on, on this country for a while. But I'm only going to be talking about the North Hemisphere right now and US and EU because it's really a big challenge to talk about the whole world. But normally data and web is crawled globally and is scraped globally, so make sure to check if you concentrate on a certain region what generally the copyright doctrine there is. One other important thing that you have to know about copyright is what attracts copyright in the data world. Is everything copyrightable? No, of course not. Factual data, data that is just put together, normally would not attract copyright. There has to be some level of originality and even narrower in Europe and the US, increasingly, courts would demand creativity. So, it has to be your own, so it has to be unique in a way, it has to be intellectual, and it has to be a creation. So copyright is the, author, the author's own intellectual creation. Anything below this threshold would not attract copyright, therefore you would not have any headache crawling and scraping such data, unless it is a database, but we'll talk about that later. And there is one very important decision in the of the European Court of Justice, which says that anything below 11 words is not copyrightable. So in order to attract copyright, it has to be the author's own intellectual creation, and it has to be at least 11 words. Whatever, it doesn't matter whether it's an abstract or the work itself consists of 11 words, it has to be at least that long. And then there is the Feist decision in the US, the early 90s, which says that a phone book does not attract copyright. It might sound self-evident for someone coming from Europe, like most of us, but actually it is not. Because before that, the US thought otherwise. They thought that if you've put enough skill and labor in your work, then it is copyrightable. Now they don't think so anymore. It has to be original and it has to be creative. So pretty much it is the same. It's an oversimplification, but of course it is not possible to explain it otherwise in this presentation. Then we have the neighboring rights or the related rights. Not only original creative works are copyrightable, but also data can be uh, protected legally as a database if you have invested substantially in the obtaining verification and presentation of the data. So if you crawl a database and you extract a substantial part of it, or if you extract multiple times 
non-substantial parts, but together they make a substantial part, you have to be aware that there might be a right that prevents you from doing so lawfully unless you obtain the consent of the database maker. And then since, since this year we have the publisher's right, it is parallel to and independent of the copyright. It's about the online use of copyrightable work, and it belongs to the publishers. But we'll see whether it works or not and what happens to it. And then whose law applies? What we discussed in the beginning, normally one would think, my law applies because I crawl and scrape from Bulgaria, and um, I, don't, I know my copyright, I know what is infringement under Bulgarian law, therefore, uh, if I'm not infringing Bulgarian copyright law, I'm fine. This is and isn't true to some extent. First, what is copyrightable is decided by the country where the author or the maker is resident or has been born and lives. So you have to be aware that there might be tweaks to this initial concept that if you scrape from Bulgaria, your law would apply. Then if you um, commit an infringement, then uh, generally the European law says that where the harmful effect occurred, that law applies and um, the, in, the party who is going to file a claim can f file a claim in the courts of, of the country where the harmful effect occurred. Where does the harmful effect occur in terms of copyright in digital environment? Where someone has been able to see and access the infringing content. So if you publish the results of your text and data mining activities in 10 or 12 countries, then um, the, um, the, the, the author or the maker of the database may choose, or the publisher may choose each of these countries to file their claim. And of course, in some of these countries, it will be very expensive to defend yourself. And in some of these countries, it will be very easy for the author or the maker, or at least easier to defend their rights. So this is important, and you have to have it in mind. But if you're releasing the content via an uh, application programming interface, API, or on subscription basis, then of course, this is, um, this is narrower, and then you can, you can have a certainty where you would be sued if it is an infringing content. So this is an important notion, and when you're publishing the results of your text and data mining activities, you better make double sure that uh, you have had lawful access and you had the right to mine. What is lawful access? You can be licensed to do your activity by the author or the maker, and this is a clear cut. You could have um, crawled and scraped content that is released under Creative Commons license. The Creative Commons licenses version 4.0 actually expressly deal with TDM, so you're on the safe side. If this is the license in question, you're pretty sure that you can do what you do, but there, then there is the share alike catch, of course. If um, the bot you have trained can be interpreted that it is an um, derivative work of the scraped content. It is a far fetch, but it is, it is not unusual for, for such theories to emerge. This means that if you disintegrate the model, you can find some of the copyrightable content inside, or you can, you can reach it and you can, you can see it actually. Then um, you have to share uh, the results of your mining activities or the bot trained on that content as well. You have to share it alike. So if you're using content um, that is released under Creative Commons licenses, you're on the safe side, you can't be sued, but you might be forced to share your um, labor, your, your work alike, like the content you, you scraped. And then if it is not in the copyleft realm, but you have a machine-readable instruction like robot text says, saying allow crawling, then you're again on the safe side, but you'd better make a screenshot or a log archive just to make sure that at the moment you scrape the content, you had access to, to, to a site where um, the instructions allow, allowed you to do so. So you can prove it if there is some problem in the, later on. 
Then, just very briefly, I, I want to make one very important difference between US and EU, because most of you would be scraping content bo in both, both places of the world. In the US, generally, if you're not using the copyrightable work for the same purpose for which it was created, the Americans think generally that um, you create work to gain profit, and this is not far from the from the truth. You create a work to obtain, to derive economic value from it. And if you're not using um, this copyrightable work to replace that uh, value which belongs to the author, then you're fine. If you write a book, and I take this book and issue it, publish it in my name, then clearly I'm replacing what you wanted to do and putting my name on it, and I'm deriving you of that value, and this is forbidden. But if I take the copyrightable work that is created in the US and use it for text and data mining, generally the US courts say, you're fine with, it, with this, because you, this is non-expressive, transformative use. You don't use it for expressive purposes. You use it for something completely different. You use it for computational analysis, and this is great. So um, I'm afraid that we will be seeing more and more bots trained on U.S. content, and less bots, we will less be hearing the European voice or cultural values or social values or way of living in the artificial intelligence that is going to become the norm in computational analysis in the next decades, because the U.S. has a more permissive regime. These two cases, um, I, I can send anyone who's interested, I can send the presentation afterwards, or it's uh, actually it's accessible. And if you click on the link, you can see the case that it refers to. These two cases are very important for defining what fair use means under US law. And there are boundaries, and if you want to see these boundaries, you can read the decisions. In Europe, it is vice versa. There is no fair use concept. There are very strictly defined statutory exceptions to copyright. And this is the problem, because if you don't fit into the exception, then you might have a problem, and you might be approached by the author or the maker of the database and sued, and you might have to wipe out um, whatever you have created, pay compensation, etc. cetera. Uh, first, I should mention the UK, uh, because since... Two, uh, 2014, they have an exception in their CDPA, Copyright Designs and Patents Act, uh, Article 29A, which says that you are free to um, access data and use it for your text and data mining activities if you do it non-profit. Now, a very important part of text and data mining activities is reproduction. You download data and you save it on your server somewhere. On a, on a rented server somewhere. This is reproduction. This is copy, right? So unless you do it properly, you're infringing. And the UK uh, Act generally says that you can download it and you can keep it as long as you want to in order to text and data mine, not for other purposes. Then you have to delete it, but um, you have to do it for non-profit purposes. So if had Boris Johnson read that, he wouldn't be saying that your copyright law is bad for the internet, because clearly the UK law is even less permissive. And then we have the new exceptions in the copyright in the digital single market directive. There are two, one in Article 3 and one in Article 4. Article 3 generally says the following. There is a mandatory text and data mining exception that countries cannot de deviate from, and authors cannot deviate from by means of a contract. And uh, it is reserved for scientific research. And Article 4 says there is an exception for text and data mining, but authors and makers of the database can opt out of it. So you can also do text and data mining for non-scientific research, for example, consumer sentiment research, but the author can say, no, I don't want my work to be used for this purpose. But for scientific research, they cannot say. So you'd better always have a scientific research purpose alongside the commercial one, if you can. So can we say that the exceptions in the EU are too rigid and off the mark? Yes. Most of the exceptions are defined 
other than these that we just discussed, are defined by the Information Society Copyright Directive, which was, which was made law back in 2001, which in the digital world is ages ago. And it is not very up to date with the current reality. There we also have some, such, some exceptions, and I have tried to outline those that can be also relevant for the text and data mining activity. One of them is that you are allowed to make transient copies for a lawful use. This means you cannot download. I know it's computationally still very expensive and sometimes impossible, but if you can find a way to mine online without downloading, just having a transient or ephemeral copy, then you are fine and probably consult your lawyer, this is no legal advice, but probably you can use this exception under the Information Society Directive and not be bound by uh, the exceptions that uh, specifically exist for text and data mining in the uh, copyright and the digital single market directive. Because you might want to crawl data and analyze it, but it might not necessarily come under the definition of text and data mining under the copyright in the digital single market directive. So you might want to use this as well. Then if you're a journalist or a press organization, there is another exception which Bulgaria has also accepted. Actually, Bulgaria is a good place to do your text and data mining activities from, generally, law-wise, because we have accepted a lot of, uh, a lot of we, we have introduced a lot of the exceptions, so if you, if you um, um, move um, in line with the Bulgarian uh, Copyright and Related Rights Act, you might be on the safe side more than if you do it from France or Germany, say. So, uh, if you're a press organization and you mine, uh, for example, you undertake media intelligence activity with informative purpose, but you have to be careful to reflect current events. This means that are events that are currently of interest to the public and there is no express reservation of the author, then you can probably be safe under the press exception as well. And we spoke already for the um, exceptions that are for text and, text and data mining in particular. Uh, can they be overridden? This means, can a contract or a machine-readable instruction or the national state's discretion override those exceptions that we just discussed? It's, it depends. For scientific research, they cannot be overridden generally. You should remember that because there are many condi conditionalities, but maybe this is the easiest way to remember it. If it's scientific research, then probably not, most likely. But if it's non-scientific research, then yes, probably the author can put a statement or make a machine-readable attach a machine-readable code on, on their website saying, please do not TDM for non-scientific purpose, I don't want you to. And then you have to respect that. It's not like the do not track sig signal, which you can either respect or not respect. This type of instruction you have to respect, otherwise you are infringing. Then what are the possible infringements? I already mentioned them, but one big complication for TDM in the EU is that we lay a lot of weight on attribution and integrity, which means that if you use my work, you have to say that Julieta wrote it, unless it's unreasonable, no, in, unreasonable and impossible to do so. But you have to be able to prove that it was unreasonable, unreasonable and impossible. Perhaps if you're using one billion works, then it might be considered unreasonable to, um, to say that you cannot attribute this, but um, this is arguable because uh, this will just raise the cost of your TDM activity and perhaps it is not unthinkable to do so. It depends on the case, so be careful about that. And integrity means that you can't change my work without me saying so, without me wanting, um, if, if, if I don't, don't want you to change my work, uh, change its integrity, then you cannot do it. Reproduction is the most infringible right which comprises copyright among all, and it means the downloading of the copyrightable work. If you, 
if you make a reproduction that is infringing, then it will be the easiest to prove. And you have to be especially careful about that and respect the exceptions, the contractual limitations, and uh, the fair use doctrine if you're mining in the US. And then making available, this means to publish the work to another audience without the author wanting this to happen. Uh, one might ask what is different audience in internet context, because if uh, there is no geoblocation, then you can just access the work from anywhere. But generally, the court practice says that if the author has published their work on one website, for example, example an IP um, blog, legal blog, where he wanted everyone to read it, and if you take this work, attribute it and everything, but publish it on another blog uh, or another website, this is different audience. So you're making available without the author's consent, and you might be infringing again. Um, in terms of text and data mining, uh, this uh, has to do with um, the situation where you publish the results of your work and it, they can be traced down um, to the original copyrightable works uh, which you used to train your bot or to um, come up with these results. And then adaptation, uh, we touched upon it. This is if your bot can be disintegrated and uh, it can actually reveal copyrightable parts of works underlying that were used to train it. And these um, abstracts must be longer than 11 words for the reason we stated before. Well, I think more or less we covered this one. And then just keep an eye on the publishers, right? Because they're a right that um, emerged this year. The publishers in Spain, France, and Germany were very active in defending it. Uh, generally, they are the same as the author's rights in online use, so a publisher may go after you, and this is important, like an author may, for the same things, and it is important because publishers will generally have um, stronger, will generally be stronger economically. So um, you, there is a greater chance that you be sued by a publisher for infringing than by an author sometimes. So this is important that it increases your legal risk uh, what you need to know is that publications after June the 6th fall in, any publications before that cannot be infringed upon for the publishers, um, and they have this right two years after the publication uh, was posted on the internet. Hyperlink, hyperlinks are excluded. This is important because people used to call this provision link text. It is actually um, not correct anymore because hyperlinks are not infringement. You can hyperlink to content still safely and um, hyperlink, sorry, you can hyperlink to content still safely and um, you cannot be sued for that. And it is also important because we will see that Google and big search engines have resisted these publishers, right, very successfully up until now. Also, the courts were not very, very willing to support the publishers in their attempts to punish search engines. So um, if this practice and this resistance continues successfully, then um, these publishers, right, may as well become a dead provision. It may exist, but be hollow and void of meaning. But we, we are wet to, yet to see what is going to happen. I guess they will go for the lower power agents that might be infringing their right instead of Google. And now, what could be the possible solutions to all this legal maze? Uh, if you're crawling, scraping, and mining with US content, then um, make sure that you know what the boundaries of fair use doctrine in, in the US are, because generally you cannot do anything. If you start using the data beyond the purpose that is allowed by the court practice, then you're in trouble. TVIs is a very good example of this. TVIs is a court case where generally they collected all the information uh, and all the videos, all the uh, all the broadcasting from different um, 
different TVs, and Fox News said, no, we don't want you to use this information, because journalists used it, uh, used um, this platform TVIs to compare how one and the same content is now being presented in different televisions. And um, Fox News said, oh, we are very sensitive uh, for obvious reasons, and we don't want our content to be compared to any other. Um, and it turned out that uh, journalists and also uh, watchers could find all the content of Fox News on this platform, TVIs. Mm, so it was not only being used for text and data mining, but uh, you could also use it to watch Fox News if you had the nerve to do it. And um, then the court said, no, this is too much. You can't do that anymore. So Fox News content is no, no longer to be found uh, since the beginning of this year on the TVI's platform. So make sure that you do not use the content that you scraped for other purposes as well, or that you lawfully accessed. It doesn't matter. And then use content released under Creative Commons licenses. Obviously, this is the theme of this fest as well. So if, um, release as much content as possible because obviously TGM um, fosters innovation and um, research. So uh, you can always use this content, but mind the attribution and share alike clauses. If possible, um, mine without downloading. I know it's expensive right now, but maybe this will change. Respect statements made by uh, machine-readable means. Have a scientific purpose alongside commercial whenever possible, because then you can make use of the mandatory exceptions under EU law. And if nothing else works, consider paying for some data sets that might be of particular value. And then data protection. Very, very briefly, please mind that when you crawl and scrape data, you may also come across personal data very often, more often than not, especially if it's consumer sentiment analysis or something. Then there is a very recent decision of the Polish Data Protection Authority, uh, which says that the scraping company must um, inform the data subjects of whatever, um, of that their personal data is being processed for TDM purposes. And this is, of course, a gigantic task. Mm, the company uh, sent some mails, but then it resisted sending snail mail to those uh, concerned who didn't have an email. Yes, that's, that's, that's an actual case. And now this will develop and maybe will reach the European Court of Justice. But be aware that information rights are not waived when you text and data mine. So uh, this might as well be an issue if there is personal data involved. And then, if you train your bot on personal data scraped from the web, mind that um, if some decisions will be taken by this bot um, and their algorithmic decisions, you might have to be able to explain them, which will be a challenge with black box uh, decision making, uh, which is typical for the neural networks. But this is for complicated bots. Perhaps uh, TDM activities are still not that related with so complicated. I don't know, professionals will say, but this is my impression. And there is a proposed regulation. The Germans are at it again. They uh, just proposed a regulation for the algorithmic um, utilization. So we will yet to see, but um, like platforms are becoming increasingly regulated on new level, it is possible that algorithms per se will also become um, regulated, and before this happens, usually there is court practice uh, and uh, authorities' practice which, which shows in which direction the regulation is going, so keep an eye on that as well. If you train a bot, you might want it to be ethically done, and uh, you might want to um, avoid discrimination bias. Th these are some very important cases uh, in terms of web scraping and crawling. The Google Spam case is very, uh, very um, famous. It's where the right to be forgotten originated from uh, 2014 in Spain. Um, there, uh, the Data Protection Authority explicitly recognizes crawling and scraping especially crawling, which is done by Google, as a legitimate activity. So you can do it, uh, it's safe, but you have to respect certain boundaries and be mindful of the EU data protection legislation. Speaking of EU, US is also in the game of data protection. They call it consumer protection sometimes. 
but for example, the Spokio versus Robinson case is very typical, and in, in this case, um, they mined uh, eight they mined uh, um, potential employees' data in order to match uh, employee, employers and employee uh, demands and requests. And then they created a false profile for a potential employee, just haphazardly. Nobody wanted to do it, but they attributed qualities to this employee we, uh, of whom he didn't possess. And then he filed a claim and won it. And this was in the US. He won it for the distress and for the potential damage that might have been caused to him because a uh, future employer would think he's lying. But he actually was not lying. He never posted this information in the first place. So be aware that data protection is also is a thing, although they might not call it this way in the US. The Bisnold fine I mentioned, this is the case where they said that uh, you have to respect the information rights. And IHIQ versus LinkedIn is also a very important case in the realm of web scraping and personal data, where um, obviously the court said that you can scrape data from LinkedIn and LinkedIn cannot do much about it. After all this ado, what did the uh, French publishers do? They uh, were most insistent to um, introduce the um, Article 15 publishers right in order to um, prevent the big crawling organizations like Google uh, from crawling their da data. And were they successful? The answer is no. Google just said, Okay, if you don't want me to post abstracts which are copyrightable of uh, uh, your works that are originally published on your platforms, then I will not be doing so. But you will not be easily found by your potential readers and your ad income will decrease. And then they said, oh, this is infringing competition. And the competition authority said, why? You have a choice. So um, this Article 15 thing is obviously not going to get publishers very far but we're yet to see. And coming back to the Boris Johnson statement that EU copyright law is harmful for the internet, well, maybe not. Maybe EU copyright law is, maybe internet is indifferent uh, right now for the new developments in the EU copyright law, because this is not the way internet works, but we are yet to see. Interesting times. Thank you. <laughs> And now we still have a couple of time for questions, oh, okay. if you want, uh, <laughs> of thought. course, only if you want. So are there any volunteers to ask something? OK, one second. Uh, thank you for the great lecture. My question is, if I'm, let's say, a US-based company and I'm scraping US-based website where the and the actual scraping is uh, in the third jurisdiction which will uh, which laws I must obey it depends for what for IP or for data protection um, it always depends in in, in law <laughs> but um, generally you will have to respect US laws uh, you have to respect U.S. laws by all means, but if your jurisdiction, the jurisdiction you're doing the scraping from is very restrictive, you have to be mindful that they might want to file a claim in your jurisdiction precisely for this reason. So uh, is there a way to go through a VPN and scrape from elsewhere? Or? Yeah, yeah that, that's my question. Is, is it better to scrape from... Uh, Always scrape from a country that is, um, let's say, fairly permissive of this activity, because they might choose to file a claim in the country where you are scraping from. So, um, if you respect the local law, the, the US law, you are fairly on the safe side. However, for example, GDPR, if you are scraping for Bulgaria, GDPR would apply no matter that you are scraping data of US citizens. And this might be a problem. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. 
sadly we do not have uh, any more time so if you want to talk to her again you can uh, find her in the speaker's corner right behind this room and uh, let us applaud her again <laughs> because her good presentation <laughs>